Hi everyone and welcome uh, to today's demonstration. So what I want to discuss with you today, and for me it's one of the most uh, interesting topics, is allowing randomness to become part of our workflow. And uh, if we go back like, to even music technology and uh, compositions, happy accidents and randomness has been part of the development and giving some of the most incredible kind of results. Even the Moog filter was actually a calculation mistake, wasn't it? So like randomness is something that we do want to allow to be part of what we do. But giving ourselves almost a collaborator in the environment and making an ecosystem that can make not decisions for us, but allow things to happen that we might or not like. There are a million ways that we can allow that to happen in different environments and I'm sure like there are tons of like uh, software you can buy that you can do certain of things I will show you but I will show you in the way I approach it in a way that I think is quite easy to understand and to implement it in your productions and in the environment of Ableton Live. Again I've made like four projects to show you like in the first one the techniques and then the second, third and fourth we're just gonna see how they work in a more complex way but first I want you to understand them. So, we have like a little backing track that I made, like uh, this jamming. This is going on. The first concept I want to show you, it has to do with the algorithms of Ableton and uh, creating uh, total randomness in certain either rhythmical or percussive or melodic aspects, or this could be implemented in anything else you want. So, let's see what I mean here. Let's bring inside anything. I'll just do one of the packs I designed for Sample Magic some year back. Uh, let's bring some percussion, why not? Okay. So some, uh, whatever, some percussion loops. This again here. This principle we're gonna work with here, then we're gonna apply it to movements. So please try to understand and to think why this is working this way and possibilities. So in reality, we have here a variety of material, which could be your analog recordings, vocals, doesn't really matter what it is. It's phrases, it's audio that you have in there. And what I want to do here is I want to create some rules for this group of, um, that exists. The rules that this will have will happen in our follow actions, which hopefully you are familiar with. When we go follow actions now, we can, say, we can give certain commands what will happen after a certain amount of time. So what we want here, we want the unpredictable uh, event to happen. So any or other, any practically will mean that after a certain amount of time the clip can jump to another one or it can jump though back to itself as well. Other it means that after a certain amount of time it will jump to another one. So we're going to say other to all of them. We can see we're getting like now this zebra pattern here which means follow actions are enabled. If now we were to play that little group we'll go like that. So like it will have like that. And uh, it's obviously very long, so what we want to do is, you see, here this is linked, which means that it will play the whole duration of the audio before taking into consideration the commands. You want to unlink that, and we can, so choose, we can choose now, for example, one sixteenth note. So now every sixteenth note, this will be going around. So this will be like just the first step, obviously. I try to explain it to you step by step. This step. So now this is starting, obviously, going around. And it can give us some variations. The problem here, though, is that it, it goes to the beginning of the other clip every time. And this is obviously making us lose the rest of the phrases. Another thing we can do now is to select all those and say legato. That means now that if I place clip A and place first 16 note of clip A and then goes to clip D, it will play second 16 note of that. And then the third of the random one. Every time around, it will keep creating whole phrases between all your material. And this again could be one of the implementations until now. So this would sound something like this for now. And what I also like to do is, um, because this sometimes can be very continuous, I like to create a few empty ones. And this is very important because obviously many of you, are, uh, I guess most of you, you're professional musicians, producers. So poses are also very important. So make a few, kill them, make them different color. So now you also have some poses that we can have in there, in the randomness. Already now, we can have between our material a million things that can happen. And we can, of course, have the opportunity to have this open and record it. And you can already, without me showing you more, which I will, you could already get a billion like combinations of phrasing in there between the material that you wouldn't have in any other way. So like, I will be... Imagine the combinations you could try now, and then you go and choose the best ones. 
But let's take it even further. So for now, we have just have everything playing in a certain amount, like every 16th node goes to a random, goes to the obviously like legato second 16th node of the next or third to the next, and making complete phrases every time around. What other parameters do we have in Ableton that we can use very, very creatively? Inside the clip view. So I'm going to go here. And um, for those of you familiar, one of the favorite sound design techniques uh, that uh, I think has been demonstrated a few times. If I have time in the end, I would demonstrate more about that on its own, but it's not necessarily part of the randomness. We can use like the algorithms, especially like the middle two, the granular ones, for more sound design, interesting textures. And we can use like obviously bits for gated things. We can use like, um, we can use like even the Complex Pro, like with the pitch, it has some nice um, results. But anyway, what we want to keep from all that is that the algorithms can give us different artifacts. So now what we want to do, Apart from just going between them, we want to get all of those things into the equation. So A, changing randomly pitch of things alongside the algorithms and also changing the time it stays on some of the clips or many of the clips together. Which obviously now, it also allows us to explore many polyrhythmic relationships between all of those, pitch relationships and algorithmic relationships. And to be fair, I mean, this is not something that you can very much plan when you're doing it. So the way I do it, and hopefully it might sound good, is like this. So let's create an empty channel because I think I deleted the other one for no good reason. Get that in there. And let's start recording that. And what we're going to be doing, so you understand, I'm going to be changing the time it stays either to one clip or groups of clips. I'm just going to be choosing some randomly. The pitch of them and alongside the pitch with the algorithm will have completely different artifacts created. So these processes, by the way, they are important to give them time and to record for a while because you never know when you are going to get the amazing phrase. Same with pole stretch. For those of you that might have used pole stretch and go to one trillion year stretches, sometimes you have to, you, to wait for it to give you the result. So we have to be a bit patient. Hopefully it will give us something nice immediately. Let's see. Okay. So I'm going to go here, select those guys, go pitch up and texture. Cool. This is going to go down. It's going to stay more on those. So it stays by this pose on the tone with left. Let's do something funky with those as well. Very nice. And you see what I mean here? You get some phrase between your material that you would never get otherwise. It gives you like thousands of thousands of combinations that you can get. And this is now a solid percussion. Imagine vocals, imagine your modular recordings, imagine anything. That's the point here. And if we have to be honest, yes, we can try to prog hard program that, but it would take a significant amount of hours to try all those combinations and editing them. So especially for like variations, feels, little like interesting textures, getting interesting textures and giving these like on the interesting textures, I've got some of the most incredible like results from that. But this is now for total randomness. Let's say you want to also, you have some recordings or some loops and you want to have some more controlled randomness of what's going on because this is total randomness right now. Let's see what we could do here. So let's do that with the little hat. So let's go drum loops here, yeah, have some hats. Uh -uh -uh. That I will do. I mean like I've recorded all of those from some weird drama scenes. I'm going to quantize it because I know they're a bit funky. Okay, and here. That will do, I mean like anything really. That will do, and also I have some questions. That's because I have made them and I know it's a bit off. But okay, let's say this too, one more. So you have like some pieces of material that you like there. And here we can talk about hats again, we can talk about vocals, we can talk about synths. The point here is that you start to, when you start to allow the software to create this ecosystem, you need to know from the beginning a little bit what you want, where you want to direct it. In this case here, you want to give them some more rules. For example, I want to say the main one will be green. Let's paint the green. Then it was red. So here, we don't want you to say, like, just do whatever you want, and, which is brilliant if we do it under the right circumstances. But we want to say that we want mainly to hear this guy here, this like main, whatever main it is, it can be your main vox, it can be like your main hat, it is the main phrase. And then we want here and there to vary. 
with some other elements that we know they might complement it nicely. So how do we do that? We could say again here, follow axioms, but now that's why we have two boxes. One rule for this one could be play again. But now you see you have a percentage down here. We have like a percentage that after a certain amount of time, how possible it is for the one thing to happen or the other. So let's call it 70%, uh, it will, uh, 69 will do. So it will play again. And 31%, uh, it will go to a random one. After, let's call it here, one bit. So it stays for a bit, otherwise we don't want this to go too often. Again, my principle, and yours, whatever you want. But in here, you don't want this to move all the time. You want this to play your, the rhythm, the pattern, whatever you like. And then once in a while, this can actually give you some variation. So in this case, this has this rule. The other guys here will have a different rule. Also follow actions, but in reality what happens, first one plays, 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 jumps to another one. The other one could be one of the other three, or four or five, whatever you have. Then the other three or four or five, they should have the rule, when it comes to me, I play it for X amount of time, give it back to you. So practically the, the other three would work with yeah, go with the first, obviously. So you see, first. And always, 100%. Because the other ones are just a little variation returning the ball back to the main phrase. By the way, something you should know if you're going to use these techniques, when you have like clips one under the other, if you break that, now these are not connected anymore. This is one group, this is another group. They need to be connected for these rules to happen between them. The only rule that can actually reconnect them would be jump. So you can select jump and a number. So if you do something extremely funky that you say this particular one could jump to another group that starts doing something completely different. The, the thing is here, Leo, the more creative you are, the more you can think your own things to do with that. Here is just rules of things that you, know, that you can do. Whenever you have cut it, you have list A and list B. Now for this one, let's look what happens. Obviously we want them to legato, because we don't want this to go randomly. We want to hear the whole phrase. What have we done with those? Go to first, 100%. And play potentially 216, something like that. And um, this one's light, let's have a look. Right. You see what I mean? It plays, 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 does a little bit of variation on the half, comes back. So you have another group here that gives us obviously more opportunities for us to have an idea, a very strong idea, but also allow this to go around and record. By the way, why I find this so interesting is many people like they are so lost in software these days trying to hard program everything. And I think some of the ideas of uh, A, allowing randomness and recording inside your DAW gets a lot of sauce in what you do than trying to MIDI everything, program it, prove it by hand. I'm sure you're not of you all do it. But I'm just saying is one thing I see in my students that actually gives very cold results if you don't have any kind of uh, recording any kinds of thing going on around and only like hard programming MIDI notes and drawing lines. Okay, another technique that I want to show you. And this one actually I got inspired by that by a release on Pump Off, DJ Koze, which um, I thought was a great uh, technique that an artist used back in the day, many years back. And uh, it gave me an idea that I'm using in my tracks and I want to show it to you as well. So we're going to put the sampler here and let me talk to you about this idea first of all. The idea is that, let's say you have an arp line or something that plays like an interesting cool pattern. Yes, we have filters, we have all that stuff that can make it interesting. However, one thing I was always thinking is like, what if uh, every time it plays a note, it's not the, the same instrument. I have, let's say, five synthesizers in the studio, and it might play one time uh, a pulse wave from the one synth, another time a saw tooth from the MS-20, another time a note from a guitar or a bazooki. So every time it actually plays a note, this arp, it's coming from a different instrument or a combination of instruments. This can give you extreme complexity in the tonal character and can also make you come incredibly interesting results. And it's very easy to do with the method I will show you. So for this to make it understandable and easy, I recorded for you from the same scene, but ideally you would like to record from different sources. So one thing I had lately was like an MS-20, a Buzuki, and uh, something from the Prophet. So like, that was interesting. But for this, I just want to show you four different waves. That's very simple. different variations here, so to like uh, pulse, uh, the square like, and the one with a little bit of ring. But uh, again, whatever you want, up to you. So I'm going to open the sampler here, and I'm going to open those guys up, and I'm going to just take my samples. 
and drag them in. So now you have like all of those playing there. What we want to do now is go to the select and we want to give it like some um, strict selection. This is going to play at 0, this is going to play at 1, this is going to play at 2, this is going to play at 3. So practically all we are doing, we are creating a rule about when will the one note play, where will the other play. And then we need to actually, you know, find a way to randomize and implement that rule. So we're going to create a macro here. And I'm going to bring the change selection, it's just a macro. I'm not going to change the range of that for now. I'm going to do it another way. And what I like to do here, let's close that now, is the following. Let's bring uh, just a little simple ARP. Uh, yeah, just uh, 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 the, the simple ARP. And now, just for you to understand exactly what's happening in this rack, you have like this control that obviously it changes which of the sound is actually being played. If we take it further, further we could also make combinations and layers of both of them and then like trigger them as well. But this would be also extremely effective. Now, if you are like in this uh, area, you could very easily just say, let's bring an LFO here. So I do like um, this LFO. This guy's quite cool. All we want really is to tell it, you know what, map that. And it's going to go a bit crazy now, obviously, if we enable the other phone. So we don't want that. We want, obviously, to make it much more controlled, max 3%. So now it can take values here. We also want to change the sine wave to random. And we want to take that to frequency. And let's see. And if I bring it now a little, just to show it, show it to you, if I was to play that... You see, like this little, little variation. This little variation that happened, and we have similar way first because I want. Imagine now between different sounds when you start adding delays and other things. So you can have here like anything you want. You can have like sounds from organic instruments and analog instruments, and then you make an ARP that might sound like really. In the end, it might sound like one instrument, even if you put like a bandpass or like a filter that makes it like not so easily identifiable as like an organic bouzouki or guitar or something in there. But then you do have these tones that alternate all the time and alternate randomly, not as a round, round robin. So like here, if we were to write uh, any like uh, stupid pattern, something like not very inspired pattern wise, but we're more con concerned with technique here. Yeah, let's close that. Yep. And um, we have done this not very brilliant pattern. That works in context. And I have like one extra option. Even without, you see, like, without anything. Even without a delay, without LV. This tiny bit like of variations it does inside, in this very slight variation instrument, for me it gives you like this kind of interest. And again, you can take that to the extreme. You saw the initial waves here were quite like similar. But in this kind of arpeggiator, I would like potentially to get slight variations. Then you can go as out there as you like. But again, this technique, please try it by, obviously before you put them in there, either you will need to put them in the right route if you know about samplers, or like if you are recording them, just record them on the same note so you don't have to do that. But you could just put the right route if you are working with samplers. But for me, this is like an idea that um, if you are using it cleverly, it can really, really, really be extremely interesting. Another thing now would go to something a little bit more light and easy, but something very important. And the thing I always like uh, struggle with with many productions like singing is like, you know, not everyone is a drummer, not everyone wants to use like uh, emulations of drummers. People like sometimes like to really, I do like to program like things in MIDI myself, play them in. But um, I would like to allow some of my elements to exist in a way like a drummer is playing them, which would never be mathematically the same. And this again now could be done in many, many different ways and be taken to very complex levels. But usually complex is not always good, by the way. Sometimes brilliant music just needs to be very simple. And if you think about it, these techniques are simple. They're very simple. And you can use them with any element you want. It's just things you can do a billion different results. If any of you uses them, you have different tastes, different instruments, different ideas. 
and they, they are just, in reality, mathematical tools that can actually be there to give you some organic results in your production. So like huts. And again, that's just a simple thing that I like to do because no one likes boring huts. But I always wanted to think like also a bit outside of the standard, because the standard here, they have like one simple pattern. The standard here would be that um, you do a pattern. So we have this hat. A typical thing like um, is either obviously we automate that by hand, or what I usually like to do if I have a hat that I like it to play at a certain decay, but I also want to keep it like a little bit interesting throughout. Again, our favorite LFO, but we can use another LFO now, just so we don't get boring. Not the blue one, I don't like the color. So, the decay here. In this case, when you are doing anything with LFOs, by the way, in randomness, before you go to the random, you want to set the range. So to set the range, always, what am I trying to do, first of all, here? In reality, you have a hat, and I would like this hat to play a little bit like a real drummer would play. It's not exactly the same every time. But I would also like to define inside my pattern then, when do I want to allow a little bit of extra? For example, if you're doing house or techno, but essentially you have a little bit more going on to the end of the phrase, so then to the other one. So potentially if we're doing the randomness, we can also start defining in which part of the patterns this should be a little bit more, you know, up there, but doing a little bit more range. So let's start though by always, I start with sine wave because I like to see, look, if you map that, immediately it shows you now the range. It will go all this way. So before we randomize it, I want to see like, you know, where we like it. Obviously not there. So first thing we want to take the depth down. So now you can see it moves like in a smaller depth. And then with the offset, we say, we find exactly the area that we want this to allow this to operate. Very simple. So we always start with the sine wave first, find the area that you want, define it, and then now you can do, uh, again, the random is one option. You could like the sign and you could leave it alone. But today I'm here to talk about like random results. And we're gonna change the sign to random. And I'm not gonna change, um, I'm not gonna, I don't like to ever sing these things. And you see already like, with that, if you were just recording that, I, I'm personally sometimes just bounce the track and I let it do it the way it likes, and I consider this part of the composition, so like, do whatever you want. You could record it and choose the parts that you want the most if you are more of a control freak. I sometimes like to just like, even leaving that part of my track, and I bounce with it, and whatever it gives me, it's fine. If you're more of a control freak, you record it and you choose the best variations that you like and edit those. But then if you want it, of course, like to go and be a bit more specific, again, something very, very easy for you to do. You could very simply just tell it the depth here to be changing in the end of the pattern. Or the whole, like the whole bit, why not? Be generous with it. You see, now it has like in the end. It allows you to go a little bit more crazy. And now we have more, more control even. So we're giving it like, you could do that in eight or 16 bar phrases. We give it like, we can give it even a slight, tiny bit. If you don't want this to be a big thing, you could even give it a tiny bit to give this kind of organicness. And for those of you that might be think, yeah, these are all really slight things and they don't really matter. Well, a lot of slight things together give you a brilliant result. So that's something I've learned through you know, many, many years caring about very slight things. Another thing that I want you to think about, so let's bring the one operator or whatever, she's on D and just do, yep.
not a life-changing melody in the history of music, but it will do the job. So just something, blank. And now, any of the melodies you might have, let's so just bring that down. Oh, I actually like that. Let's see how that. Any element. This could be from bass lines to like uh, pads to lead lines to... One of the biggest uh, things that I think people don't think about is that, um, okay, we have like this bass, we're potentially side-chaining or gating it to another element, like some hat, some other thing. And this practically works towards the signal that comes from something else. However, on many of your tracks, you might have a fair amount of different percussive elements, different like rhythmic elements, different things that all together combined in different ways, they could be instructing a wild amount of different movements for the other instruments. Let me show you what I mean. Because I'm sure you have thought to side chain that the bass to the kick, or to gate like this synth to the hats. But you know what, your tracks might have like more interesting elements. And let's get rid of this, let's make it together. So like, let's make H. And you return track. I'm gonna call that SC, trigger. Now we're going to say to that, you know what, we don't want you to go to the master. Send only. So practically, what we're going to be doing there. And let's bring for this example, uh, I'm going to show you like with a pad and a gate. So let's bring this guy uh, 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 there. Now, let's have it. Let's close the gate for now, it doesn't have anything. So practically, let's see something. If we have like um, any element that you want, you're going to go to your element and say, the compressor now will say chain to that H. That H now, though, could be anything that you want, which means, if you have like, um, if you give it a few kicks, one element to restore, and let's do that, let's show you here, just that. So now, but imagine now, you have this end. What if it responds to that as well? So it responds to two elements now. But it can respond less or more to that. So imagine now if you had some percussion, some other things. What if you send different things to the group and then different elements, they don't respond to one kick, one thing, but they can respond to groups of things, to whole rhythmical relationships that you are creating. And this could even be dynamic. You could even be changing and sending like, um, Changing the amount that you send of anything. And this is again a simple example. What if we bring afterwards, you know, the hats that we just made? Where are our hats? That's too, that's too, too intense, this hat. The movement, can you see the movement changes completely the way this interacts? Completely different. Imagine that now on a dynamic level, because on the last project, I'm going to show you a way that I'll show you now, basically. One thing you could do is just, let's get rid of that and do it together. So you could create an empty MIDI track, and all this MIDI that I show you, like from Max for Live, is native. So you can find it if you have downloaded like the essentials. If you get this guy on a separate like um, MIDI track, it's actually a good shout, this thing generally, because it allows you to map across your whole session. So you could even have like sessions, sections of, and elements and uh, things that you like across the whole section mapped here. And then it's easier to see the controller, it's easier to put clips there. But what if you had now these? Imagine like on, um, you know, the kick. This. I think you're, you see where I'm going with this now. So suddenly, the amounts that go to H that will instruct how much this will work to a compressor or a gate or whatever you want, really. This can now be alternating. This can be either alternating with LFOs, so we have seen that before. So you could be using LFOs, we said not the blue one in this case, but the yellow LFO. Either like LFOs that could move these randomly now and completely changing how these move, or if you wanted some kind of more uh, control. One technique that I think is more fascinating, because you saw when we were trying different uh, 
balances before on the H, we liked some instances more than others. So potentially when the kick was going more to the H and they beat the hats, possibly we got something we really like, maybe we get some other like balance that we really like. So for this kind of thing, I would possibly, when I have the balance of something, I would just say, let's make a clip here and I would say, you know, I'm just going to make it roughly so you understand it. I'd say like, for example, you know, this one, I want the H to go all the way up. And if we press that now, you see, this has actually moved the H. And this is across all the elements that we liked to send and to use like for the SC trigger. And then you could say, for example, on the other one, you could say here, macro one, less, macro two, let's say it was there. So you start making now all the balances that you liked before and you knew that they worked. And what if you take the principle that we discussed in the beginning and then we start actually follow actions, these movements. So now rhythmically, you are not, because if you, if you think about it, in this process, if you send different amounts of that, sometimes the movement is not very nice. And we need to get it to a specific point that we really like it. So we establish here which actual movements we really like, and we establish exactly how much. Here, that's why we choose one method over another. If we actually went with the LFO, sometimes we would get through amounts of uh, the same. That, is not sound, that doesn't sound very good, which is fine. We could record that and choose. But if we want to make something that actually will rhythmically behave in a way that was always to our liking initially when we saw it, then, you know, because this first one, we, when we played them, for example, this could mean I, I want you to send, you know, a bit more like from the kick, a little bit on the hats. So you knew you liked that. You designed that on the first clip. On the second one, you might like less of the kick, a bit like from these hats and the clap. You designed that, you put the lines. I'm not going to do all those because I prefer to use my time to show you some other things instead of doing that one by one. But you see the point when we did it initially. And then now you could even say that this could start moving between them. Because if you have five of those, you could say, you know, play one bit of that and then to change something else. And you see like movements then, for example, for, uh, from Caribou and some of the they change, they're not the same. And you could achieve that in very, very simple ways. Just let some of your elements respond to what already you already have in there. So that's another thing that I really, really like to have in this. Now, I'll show you another device. Let's go to the project I have made for you. And this one has like two things that I want to show you. So one thing like I created and I was pretty pleased with, in this first one, and again, you will see it in more detail when you actually get it. You have like on your drums, and we know now, by now we understand our favorite LFO, that is moving stuff randomly, that I hope we get it. What I have done here is I've made um, a little rack, but practically you have the dry of your drums, but then I have created like using different instances of beat repeat, little ghost notes that it can, they can be created whenever we want. So like each one of those, if you get rid of that now. So you hear like, this, this, this does that. This does nothing. Yep, good one. This does that. Since I have actually found positions, this is more towards like, uh, this works very well for four to the floor beats in terms of the positions I have set. If you are going to work with like different time of uh, time signatures, you might have to change some positions so they work for most common patterns. But what I have done here is I have allowed this to be in there and then also given it um, a little LFO. So this could be changed, you know, randomly and give me some ghost notes and then I record them and I have them. Another way of doing it. This, again, if you, when you get it, you see it's very useful that because you just put it in there and it does some cool stuff. And of course, you have all the different areas that you can go in there and change them. They all work with the same principle we saw initially, that you have like all of those set up once per selection, and then you select. So that is the one thing here. The other thing which is pretty important to show you in this is the following. So what I have here is practically just a little rack, which I have just put some, a few snares. Yeah, there are snares. Now, the one thing like that um, I want to do in this particular rack is 
use it for two different ways. So one way would be when I press something, when I launch pad or my push, it will always play a different tom. So it will give me always like a varied kind of weird thing going on. Or if I actually hard program it inside my MIDI pattern, it will also give me a varied pattern every time. And this is brilliant for making like uh, drum fills and tom uh, drum fills, snare fills. Uh, really interesting way to do it and really simple as well. So all you want to do here, you see I have like a, a simple MIDI pattern, but I have given it certain rules. The one rule is that essentially I'm putting that velocity all the way down and I'm giving it the possibility that the velocity can actually take any value from 0 to 127. So every time it goes around, the velocity of every hit can vary to any of those, can be any of that. I have reduced how much associated the velocities with volume, so it, it doesn't make it too quiet sometimes. I want to keep them like a bit consistent because we're going to use the velocity to control something else. And I have also changed the chance. So practically, they are not going to play always the same hits. Sometimes the, some hits are going to play, sometimes some others. So here we want to explore also how Ableton inside the actual piano roll give us opportunities for that. But how can we use them like even more effectively? So we said we have like here velocity from one, 0 to 127. Every time it goes around, it could be anything. So what we are doing here is we are bringing expression control. And as you can see, we are associating the velocity with pitch. And now every time it actually plays the same pitch, since we have fixed the min and max correctly, this will actually play every time randomly one of the toms we have in there. And let's hear it. See what I'm saying? Yeah, I actually use that like for this kind of uh, track. And I just recorded them like uh, on this, and I'm using them for another track on the album. And I'm like, if I was trying, I was, I'm also a little bit lazy sometimes with all these toms and things. If I allow it and I program it and I have that, then I can give it samples that I record, and I can let it do a little bit its own thing, and then hear it. And it's okay, this sounded really cool and interacted. And another thing, if you have a few of those things happening, what I showed you, then the way they interact as well rhythmically, it can give you some extremely unexpected results. So, like, um, thinking of combinations of all of those to use, I think it's the key here. Again, our group of randomness, and I want to go to the second example, because here we had mainly that I want to show you. So, another thing, but I didn't write a note for it. Everything is written through randomness. So, what we have going on here? A few things going on here. So, one is that that we did before. So we have like a synth, another synth, and a bouzouki. So here I'm actually using three different things going on. And this, I've actually run it through a bandpass filter to show you like that it can start as an... So it can be really obvious. Oop, yeah. But then you could also like make it much less obvious. And even these slight variations for me could do the difference in the track. Sometimes you want a big difference, sometimes you want the slight. So this we're using the technique we saw previously. Here we are using a simple. And here, final one, we are using an LFO, which is controlling a pitch, which is locked to a scale. So another simple technique. But the last one, this is my favorite se sequencer by far. So this is using this sequencer, which I hope I have like three minutes to show you when I finish showing you everything around that. Which for me is like, um, is based on the modular sequencer René, which I have in my wall of uh, stuff at home in the modular. And this allows you, I don't know if you had like the snake game on the phone in the past. That's why it's called the snake sequencer. And I'm randomizing the snake movements, but I'll show that to you in a second. By the way, this is one of the best sequencers you can get in terms of like possibilities. The other thing I'm doing here, I have triggers that... Um, so, all the delays and stuff go then to this return track. Pay attention to that because again, for this kind of bonobo stuff, this can be really interesting. So all the delays, the reverbs, all the textures are going to, they're being sent to here. And then that track, it, it holds the reverb, the delays, all the textures, 
And then I'm using like a trigger track, which is not going anywhere. And it's just like a rhythm I like, but you could use the principle we saw before, combining some of your existing elements to use as a trigger. And this is actually gating the whole texture in the background, but I have a randomization on how much. So without it. And this is randomizing how much. And all of that, you see, all the textures in there, everything is random. And I'm sure I have something going on there. Yeah, this is the decay of the randomness. Last thing I want to show you this uh, sequence, if I have like uh, three minutes, I think I can do it in three minutes. So, snake sequence. So what's extremely cool about that, guys, is the following. Let's give an operator. Give ourselves a little acid sound. So initially, let's go and look at scale. Let's go with, um, I don't know, let's go with like Alpha Twins favorite scale, F sharp Phrygian. And um, let's just like say, here initially you can choose, you see you have notes, gates, velocities, and custom. So you can randomize notes, but pay attention to that. You have speed, obviously. You have like how many steps, so you play less steps and then shift that to go towards direction. Okay, imagine now for all that you have also infinite snake directions and that together with reducing steps and changing like where it's shifted, this is just for pitch, then you could have for gates or gates being slower or having like notes being faster than the gate. You can get some like... It's absolutely ridiculous. This is gonna delay now, it's gonna start giving you like... And velocities. Again, all of those parameters separately for each of those. Imagine like all the possibilities for each of those separately. And we can randomize inside a certain like area. And again, I could find something I like and shift it. And what about then three more of all that for any parameters you want? So this could be like. Or like even, you know. And now having reverbs, the velocities, all that. And if you think about like the possibilities of uh, parameters and the combinations between all of that, I've got some of the most ridiculous and beautiful lines through this. And I consider that uh, random itself because you can randomize each of those things. Or like if you want to go even further, as we saw before, put an LFO and randomize that even further so it changes the snake parameters and the shift. And you go like proper math. That's the time they gave me, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, guys.